hello there welcome to the classical books of china series um the first real author um, i would like to discuss in this series is a guy called han yu and uh, han yu lived in the tang dynasty so his dates are 768 to 824 and he is considered to be the greatest prose stylist of the whole era and uh, I've been reading his complete prose works during the last few weeks, which I have in a two-volume set with plenty of annotations. Uh, one of the magnificent things about China really is that um, it's churning out these fantastic scholarly editions of uh, classical works at an astounding speed now. And uh, the edition I'm using for Han Yu uh, was published in 2004 and is annotated by a guy called... Uh, a professor called, I should say, Yan Qi, who is an expert on this author. And uh, I thought that I should actually devote this uh, episode to technicalities, you might say. I mean, even if even before I start talking about the author, I would like to describe a little bit uh, what a book like this looks like. So scholarly editions of classical literature, they're usually printed in the traditional format, which means that the text runs from top to bottom on the page and the columns are arranged from right to left so that means that you actually read the book backwards you start in the back and you end up in the front which is kind of a funny feeling the first few times but it's something that you get used to and uh, these books are also printed in traditional Chinese characters even if they're published in the People's Republic and I think they're the only exceptions to this rule. Otherwise, in uh, People's Republic, you only get uh, simplified characters for all writing. But I'm not sure about that. There might be other uses for traditional characters as well. Um, I thought that the thing is, I'm doing this channel partly for people who might be interested in studying the subject by themselves. And uh, I think it's really helpful for such people to know the basics. And there are an uh, there, there's an ocean of different editions of the major classical works available in China, but most of them are actually not very useful for the serious student. So if you're interested in this, it's important for you to know what to look for. So if we take a look at this book, for example, for every text, it contains the main text, which is in larger type. Then you have the commentary in smaller type after every main paragraph. And this is the arrangement I prefer, actually. Many uh, traditional scholarly editions put the commentary in smaller type right after each sentence, which I think is a veritable eyesore. It becomes very difficult to orient yourself in a book like that, and it's uh, certainly close to impossible to read such a book for pleasure. So if I see a book like that, I usually avoid it. Uh, now you might ask yourself, like, what commentaries, annotations, what, are, what am I talking about? And um, if you're not into classics or classical language study, you might never have come into contact with annotated editions like this at all, even in other languages. And uh, I realize that the need for having commentaries isn't obvious. But basically I would say that if you're a student, a Western student of Chinese literature, uh, commentaries for original texts aren't something that you can do without most of the time. It's really, really helpful to have them. And there are different types of commentaries. Uh, first of all, good editions always contain textual remarks. That is, they will note variants in different available manuscripts, and they usually also provide some kind of discussion for the editorial choice that's been made. Uh, for most authors of this age, the process of assembling a scholarly edition of this kind is to compare all the available manuscripts. And you have to do this because the original manuscripts, uh, the ones written by the author himself, I mean, they're almost never available for authors this ancient. And when you look at copies from hundreds of years afterwards, there will inevitably will be uh, small variants. And often... Uh, a textual annotation can uh, quite easily establish obvious corruptions. Uh, by corruptions, I mean uh, when there are misspellings or there are obvious gaps in a sentence or there are extra words or something else like that. In some cases, however, uh, it's not always obvious how the original text went. Uh, 
And in those cases, a good commentary like this one usually includes some discussion about the different variants and tries to establish the most likely one. And I say the most likely one because this is really an area where scholars tend to disagree. It's emphatically not an empiric science to establish which one of two or more variants is the most obvious one. It takes a lot of intellect, a lot of knowledge, and a lot of taste, honestly, to be able to do such kind of work competently. And for Han Yu, there is a rather authoritative textual criticism by the great Song Dynasty philosopher Zhu Xi. And uh, this commentary or this critical edition is referenced rather heavily in this volume. But uh, this volume also contains opinions from many other people who have worked on the text throughout the centuries. Um, and I think it's usually not appreciated what kind of work it takes to put ancient texts like this in a readable format. Uh, so where possible, I will try to point out where the labors of textual critics uh, can be essential to understanding. Uh, that's just because I think this is such an underappreciated work in today's society. Uh, my basic uh, point of view is that philology should be at the center of all human sciences, and this is philological groundwork uh, at its most basic. But uh, uh, as literature, this kind of commentary is usually rather boring, and it's frankly inessential if you're reading more for content. So, personally, I usually skip these comments or I just browse them very quickly. Um, another thing that a good annotation does is to provide the historical background for different events and persons that are mentioned in the text. So, this edition, for example, it gives you a likely date of composition for each piece, or you can establish such a date at all, of course. And it provides brief biographies of persons that are mentioned in the texts. And it will flesh out different events mentioned with a sort of proper historical background. And since this is a proper scholarly work, uh, it almost always cites the actual sources for all these persons and events, uh, if those are available, that is. Which means that when you read the commentaries, you will get little snippets of the actual uh, officially compiled histories of the Tang Dynasty and so forth. Which is kind of exciting if you're trying to learn the language. And if the textual criticism bit is something that you can skip, and that I often skip, uh, these contextual annotations uh, are something I really find myself reading quite carefully often. Uh, because it's a peculiar thing with Chinese literature that it often has a very tight connection to actual life. Uh, a guy like Han Yu, for example, is not a fiction writer. And that goes for uh, most authors of the, of the Chinese tradition, including the poets. Um, so the first volume that I've been reading, uh, I'm sort of a bit into the second volume by now, uh, it's, uh, it consists mostly of letters to various people, it's different kinds of occasional prose, uh, it's uh, obituaries, uh, well, those should be called sacrificial texts actually. Uh, which means they are texts commemorating various deceased persons. And it's kind of obvious why texts like that are um, difficult to understand without annotations. Uh, if you're very knowledgeable about the general history of the period, that will help you a lot, of course. And that would probably mean that you can skip a lot of these comments. But many of them simply refer to various details of the author's personal life, and the various events that he was embroiled in. And if you don't have the proper annotations, reading this kind of texts uh, very easily feels like listening to one person talking on the phone, if you know what I mean. It's, you, don't, you don't hear what the other person is saying and you don't know what the conversation is about. And for people like me, uh, or like you maybe, if you're, not, if you're not an expert on Tang Dynasty history to begin with, this kind of commentary is, is very good for providing this sort of basic framework for, for uh, the, the context as well. And the third category of comments, which is the kind that um, I usually are, am the most interested in, are the ones that will explain obscure language and that also trace various literary references in the works. And I would say that even if you're fairly used to reading classical Chinese, in this kind of texts, 
um, there will usually be certain things that that are gonna tr throw you off your rocker, even if you're not even if you're not sort of a, a complete beginner. Uh, as long as you're not a serious expert in the field, uh, you're you're gonna find these comments useful because Chinese is an immensely rich language, and especially with a consummate language artist like Han Yu, there are going to be a lot of idiosyncratic points of usage that you haven't seen before. And some of the time it's uh, simply a matter of rare words. And in that case, a good annotation like this one, it will simply give you a more familiar equivalent so that you don't have to look it up in a dictionary. But very often the main difficulty isn't so much rare words. It's that there are obscure phrases that actually contain uh, an allusion to an ancient work. And this is especially the case with the more theoretical treatises that that you will find in this volume, for example. But the problem is endemic to all of classical literature. This is a thing that to the, ed to the educated people of the day, it was sort of a habit of language to continually refer to various passages in ancient works. And this is because there was a canon, an established canon of writings, which you as a writer could presume that everybody knew. So you didn't need to explain where you got it from. People would recognize it because they had been forced to memorize this thing from the from from childhood and, and onwards and um, the people would get your point and it means that a lot of things can be expressed rather less directly simply by using a well-placed allusion here and there and this is really an essential part of understanding this type of text and it's one of the things that I think is so fascinating about this kind of literature um, but it's also one of the things that makes it almost impossible to translate a lot of this literature in an adequate way. Because um, what do you do? Would you translate the allusion straight on? Or would you try to provide some context? Would you try to exchange it for something, uh, something comparable in your own language? It's never an easy choice as a translator. But anyway, what a good edition like this does is that it will mark the various quotes and allusions in the text and then it will quote chunks of the original text that the that the quote was taken from in the footnotes and so you will have this sort of cross references to various ancient works all the time in the footnotes and i suppose that this is something that would drive some people crazy and if this things this kind of thing sounds like a nightmare to you i can tell you right off that you should do better things with your time than studying classical languages for me, I happen to love this sort of thing almost above anything else. It's just a total delight for me to see authors juggling phrases with, with each other uh, through the centuries like this. Um, what, what I really like, especially, is if I'm sometimes able to identify phrases like this by myself. Because that means that if I don't need the commentary to identify this phrase from somewhere else, it means that I know the original uh, classical work well enough in order to to use it productively in in as a type of intellectual work, you might say. So it gives me a certain sense of accomplishment. It's it's like um, weightlifters breaking a personal record or something. It's like yeah, I got that one. But for the most part, um, that is also something that I would need a commentary for. I'm usually not that good. But uh, anyway, actually, this, this kind of thing is something that is it's really not peculiar uh, only to Chinese literature, even if I think the phenomenon is extra prevalent in this tradition. If you read Renaissance authors, for example, you will find this thing all the time as well. Uh, a real good example that I've been reading quite a lot is uh, Montaigne, the French essayist. Uh, his works contain various quotes from Latin poets and philosophers on almost every page. And uh, w what I think is really fun with this is when you can go back to the source in those cases and you see how much of the argument of the, of the new work is actually taken from the original or modified from the original. Um, so, that, so that's um, wh one of the things that you really need the commentaries for. And this book, uh, this one, by Han Yu, or this edition of Han Yu, it also includes a fourth category of comments, which come after the running remarks on the actual texts, 
and that is that it for every text includes or not every text but for most texts it includes the selection of critical remarks or comments by various literary critics throughout history and these are um, I would say they're not strictly necessary for a good understanding of the text but they're interesting so it enhances the sense of um, you know this literature as a collective endeavor and I think it's um, very it's very enjoyable to read um, uh, you know, get some sense of the first-hand reception of the author. Um, but this is not very common, actually. I haven't seen this with many books before. And um, it might have something to do with the fact that Han Yu is such an inescapable influence on later writers in the Chinese tradition. I'll get into that into late, in later uh, episodes of this series. Um, almost every text by Han Yu seems to have been critically commented on by later writers. Well, this, so this kind of comments, they are like the category of appreciations or stylistic criticism, you might say. And so they're not, they're not really inescapable by any means, but, but they might be interesting. And um, the other thing that's good about reading a book with this kind of critical apparatus is that uh, this traditional kind of commentary uh, gives you a lot of practice reading classical Chinese because all of these comments are in classical Chinese, even the ones that are by the modern editor. So you get, you get to enhance your understanding of the source text by diving into a commentary literature that's also in the same language. And that's extremely good for your language skills. And it's, it's certainly the way that I have been able to uh, achieve any kind of reading fluency in classical Chinese, uh, such as it is. Um, anyway, I thought I would um, dive more into the actual meat and potatoes concerning this author in... Uh, later episodes of the series so i'll just call it a day from here thank you for listening <laughs>